they've been telling me Bitcoin is going to collapse since Bitcoin was at $100 and here we are at $70,000. Maybe those people are idiots. And then you start thinking, well, those people lied to me about money. I wonder what else they might have lied to me about. And that's why everything that we learn in university is just inflation propaganda. It's a bunch of people who have a money printer and they want you to believe that them being able to print the money that you have to work hard for is actually for your own good. That's the major lie. So you think the governments are manipulating the people completely? Very much so. I don't believe that there is a necessity for a government system. For me, government is all coercion. I think anything that human beings want can be achieved consensually without coercion. There's Bitcoin and then there's shitcoin. Everything else is an indistinguishable lump of shitcoins. Uh, they do not matter. The only one that matters is Bitcoin for two primary reasons. Can you tell me what was the time that you bought your first Bitcoin? Who are you? My name is Sif Din Amos. And? <laughs> And I am uh, the author of three books. One is called The Bitcoin Standard. The second is called The Fiat Standard. And the third one is called Principles of Economics. I also teach economics online on my own website, my own learning platform. And um, yeah, I talk about Bitcoin a lot. What is your background through your life previously that you became a teacher? Yeah, I was a university professor um, at the Lebanese American University. Before that, I uh, got a PhD in uh, sustainable development from Columbia University. And for that, I did a master's degree at the London School of Economics and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at the American University of Beirut. And before that, I uh, was a high school kid in uh, Ramallah in Palestine. Okay, interesting. So are you, you were always interested about money? I wouldn't say always. I think I got into it and became interested in uh, around the time that I was in uh, in university, started my curiosity about economics, and then I entered into graduate school. And that's when I became very focused on this topic. And so your relationship with money, can you describe to us how it evolved and why, what you found interesting in this topic? What I found, uh, initially I was just curious about economics, but I didn't have very strong opinions about it. And I, uh, about three years into my PhD, we have something called the comprehensive exam. And when you take a comprehensive exam, you're supposed to read an enormous amount of literature. And I read a lot. And I thought by the time I take that exam, I will have come to an understanding of um, all of these issues about economics. But I, after I took it, I passed. And still, I thought about it and I realized, you know what? I don't really think this is uh, making much sense to me. There was something that didn't make sense. Uh, as, as somebody who studied engineering, things just didn't click. If this was a machine, it wasn't going to work. Something about it didn't make sense. And then I started um, coming across different perspectives on economics, at which point I came across something called the Austrian School of Economics, which, are, which is basically a heretic school uh, today. They are uh, wrong, if you ask Everybody in the mainstream, everybody in the university, the Austrians know they're bad, they're evil, they're wrong, they're stupid. But they make sense. And once you start listening to them and reading them, everything begins to make sense. And everything that you used to learn before starts to make sense. And then you understand the issue of money and why all economics is designed to not make sense. It's not just that it doesn't make sense because, well, you know, some academics are lazy or they're not good communicators or it's too complex or it's too difficult. No, it's made to not make sense to you so that it fools you and prevents you from understanding what money is. And so then you will continue to use governments as horrible monies. And that's, that, that's the function that modern economics education serves. It is propaganda in the favor of government inflation. So what clicked into Austrian economics that didn't click before? What was the big thing that made sense? Their explanation of money as a uh, phenomenon from the market, that the money can emerge on the market. You don't need the government to have money. And this is something that becomes very obvious once you think about it for a few minutes, because We've had money before. We've had governments. We have societies that have had money for a very long time. 
and money emerges everywhere in the world without government being needed for it to function. And once you understand why and how it emerges, you realize why it is gold that became money throughout the world. By the early 20th century, the whole planet was effectively using gold as money, more or less. And there's good reason for that. And the reason is not that it's yellow and shiny. It's not because governments liked it. It's because of the properties of gold that make it the best form of money out there. Now, once you realize that, you realize, okay, well, then why don't we have money anymore? Because a lot of people benefit a lot from you not using gold as money. Gold is the best money for you, but it's not the best money for me for you to use. And what is better for me is for you to use a form of money that I can print for free. So if I can convince you that you work and produce things, but then instead of getting paid with gold, which nobody can make, which is difficult to produce, which is good at holding on to its value, I convince you to take a piece of paper with my signature on it instead of money. I'm going to be very, very well off. I can buy anything you want with a piece of paper because I can make these pieces of paper effectively at zero cost. So here's a piece of paper. I want to buy your house and I just sign at it. It cost me three cents to make that piece of paper, but I could buy your house for a million dollars with that piece of paper. So people who have that magic printer that gives them pieces of paper that they can use to buy real goods and services from others are obviously enormously emotionally and intellectually and financially invested in the success of this. And that's why everything that we learn in university, in my opinion, is just inflation propaganda. It's a bunch of people who have a money printer and they want you to believe that them being able to print the money that you have to work hard for is actually for your own good. That's that's the major lie. So you think that uh, the governments are manipulating the people completely for their own benefit, and that's ro- uh, that doing harm for the people. You think, in comparison to having gold or Bitcoin? Very much so. Can you explain us a bit about this? The basic idea is that. Um, When money is uh, gold or when money is chosen on the market freely, whatever gets chosen as money is the thing that is the hardest to make. It's the thing that is hardest for other people to create more of. And so you're going to use as a form of money something that is difficult for others to make in large quantities. People will realize this if they think about it intelligently, but even if they don't think about it, it's going to inevitably materialize in the real world because if you choose something that's easy to make as money, you end up with no money. So if you decide that I'm going to use as my money uh, tree leaves, you and say a thousand people, you live in Cyprus, right? You and a thousand people in Cyprus decide we're going to start using tree leaves as money. Well, what happens then? All of you are going to become poor. You're going to keep accumulating more and more tree leaves, and then the tree leaves are going to be worth nothing. And nobody's going to take your tree leaves eventually because they, it's very easy for anyone to make more tree leaves. So if you sell, let's say you run a restaurant and you want to accept tree leaves for the restaurant, you're going to keep selling all of your stuff. You're going to accumulate a big giant cash balance of tree leaves, and the value of the tree leaves is going to go down. It's very easy for anybody to make tree leaves. So, If, on the other hand, your neighbor chooses to use gold as money, well, nobody can just print gold for free. Nobody can easily make gold. And so he's going to run a restaurant, say, similar to yours, but he's going to collect money in the form of gold. And so as a result, he's going to have significant wealth that's not going to be inflated away. So you do this for a few years, and then eventually the money is inevitably going to be only the thing that is hard. So whether you realize this and come to understand it and come to realize and understand why tree leaves are bad money, whereas gold is good money, doesn't matter. Ultimately, the only wealth, the only money that is going to be left is going to be money that is held by people. It's going to be hard money that is held by people that is hard to make. Everybody else, all the other forms of money are going to get destroyed. So when he goes toward what is hard to make, because everything else is constantly being produced more of, and so the value for it declines. And so if everybody used something like gold as money, which is hard to make, the result is that 
everybody can store the value that they produce in something that is hard for others to take. So you work as a dentist, as a cleaner, as a taxi driver. At the end of the day, you save a fraction of your wealth. You spend some, you save some. And if the money is hard, the money that you earned today from, say, washing dishes at a restaurant, you could save it for another 10 years. And in 10 years' time, you would expect that money to have maintained its value. In fact, it will have probably gone up in value a little bit. So if you save money from washing dishes today and you wait 10 years in a form of money that is like uh, gold, that is hard, in 10 years' time, you're likely going to be able to buy more apples, oranges, cars, houses with that money than you would when you first saved it. So then... Over time, you are able to save for the future. You're able to provide for your future self. You're able to take care of your future self. And that is a hugely important technology for us as human beings because it allows us to start thinking of the future more and stop thinking only of the present. So we move toward thinking more of the future. We start providing for the future. We start saving more and more. We become more and more productive because we have more savings, which means we can use the savings to uh, make capital goods. And all of that relies on our ability to have good money. Now, when government destroys that good money and replaces gold with their money, and their money is being increased every year, depends on where you are. But the, rate, the supply of gold increases every year by around one and a half to two percent. So every year, there's only a 1% to 2% increase in the supply of gold. Well, with fiat money, with government money, in the last 60 years, we have an average increase of about 14% per year. So in other words, uh, every year, the money supply goes up around 14% globally on average. Now, of course, in the case of the dollar and the euro and the Swiss franc, it's usually lower than that. It's usually around 7 8 9% per year, which is much better than 14, but still a lot worse than 1% or 2% as is the case with gold. And but So with some other countries, it's much higher. It's 50%, 100%. So Zimbabwe or Venezuela or Lebanon, when they have hyperinflation, the money supply is going up at 100 or sometimes maybe 200% per year increase in the money supply. So the money is doubling and tripling per year, which is very bad because the value of the money is being destroyed. So when we've moved toward the form of money that is easy for government to create, it's obviously very good for the government because they can finance themselves whenever they want, however they want. So if they need to build something, if the president wants a new palace, if the president wants the government to fight, uh, wants the army to go fight a war against another country that pissed him off for some stupid reason or the other, if uh, his uh, cronies want to get rich, if he wants to buy an election, click print, make more money, and you have whatever you want. And of course, at university, they teach you that this is something that has no cost. We're just making money out of thin air, but there's no cost to it. But of course, there is a cost, and the cost is reflected in the reduction in the purchasing power in the money that other people hold. So government becomes powerful. Government can finance itself as much as it wants. But you become weak. You become unable to provide for your future self. You are unable to save for the future. You are unable to think of the future. And you are transformed into an animal that needs to think about survival every single day without much ability to provide for the future. In other words, the way that I was summing up is that what makes us civilized, what makes for human civilization is our ability to delay gratification and think about the long term and plan for the long term and um, save for the long term and become long-term oriented uh, human beings. And that is dependent on our ability to have a form of money that works for the long term. But if we shift to a form of money that doesn't work for the long term, for a money that's always constantly getting debased and destroyed, then we lose that ability and we are flung from a process of civilization to de-civilization. Instead of accumulating more capital, increasing our productivity, having a better standard of living every year, when our money is getting destroyed, all of that goes away and we're back to being uh, effectively, we're returning to 
animal behavior. So the only difference between a good currency and not a good currency is being finite, as I understand. Well, uh, not exactly. I mean, I guess the best currency would be finite. And Bitcoin is the only finite currency we have because Bitcoin is the only currency that I can tell you with confidence there's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin. But before Bitcoin, we've never had anything that was finite. So gold isn't finite. Every year we find more gold. And the more we dig, the more we find. The important thing is not so much that it is finite. The important thing is that um, I, I'd say the generally more important thing is most important thing is that people choose it freely. So this is the definition of sound money or in, in from the Austrian perspective, it's money that is chosen and valued freely on the market that you accept payment in gold because you want to, not because anybody puts a gun to your head and you accept the price or the purchasing power of gold based on your own desire yourself, not because somebody put a gun to your head. So what matters is that people choose it freely. And then what makes people choose it freely is, I mean, being finite is the best situation here. The second best to being finite is that it's difficult to increase the supply of it. And that's the case with gold. Gold only increases at around one and a half to two percent per year. And the reason for that in the case of gold is because gold has been getting produced for thousands of years around the world, but it doesn't ruin. So 5,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians had some gold that they used as jewelry. That gold could today be in a gold coin that you can buy in your local gold shop, or it could be in some piece of jewelry that is worn by somebody you know. Gold is just constantly accumulating. It never ruins. It doesn't rust. It doesn't corrode. It doesn't evaporate. There's no way of ruining gold. So all the gold that we produce is constantly accumulating. So even though we're always getting better at finding more gold, and the amount of gold production this year is higher than last year and higher than in the year before and the year before. And it's always, we're always producing more gold. But all of that gold is being added into the liquid stockpiles that people are holding and trading with one another. So therefore, the new production, even though it goes up, it is still a small fraction of the existing stockpile. And so therefore, every year, we're only adding a tiny little fraction to the supply of gold. And that's why it's such good money because no matter what happens, we know that next year we're not going to have 20% increase in gold supply. Nobody can do it. We're always looking for gold and we're always only adding about one and a half to two percent. Now it can happen with other metals like copper and silver. Well, maybe not silver, copper and um, nickel and all these other metals. They can get their supply increased at 20%, 30% per year. And the reason for that is that these metals are consumed. Copper is consumed, nickel is consumed, it's used in industry and uh, then it gets ruined and it gets rusted and then it gets thrown away. So therefore, the amount of liquid copper that people are holding and trading with one another today on the market is a tiny fraction of all the copper that we've produced over the past thousands of years. Because most of the copper that was produced over the past thousands of years has been consumed. So annual production today is significantly large compared to the stockpiles of copper. And so if the price of copper goes up, it's possible for copper miners to bring in a lot more copper onto the market and bring the price down. It's not possible for gold miners to do that because gold is accumulating thousands of years of reserves. Copper only has a few years of reserves out in the market. I have a question about, uh, let's say, with the current form of money that we have, maybe is more productive because... Uh, we have the ability to get loans and in a gold standard or Bitcoin, we don't have banks and loans. I don't know. Maybe we have. I think it would be possible to have, um, you know, there was, there was lending on a gold standard. Now, the important thing is, uh, uh, well, it could be, yeah, I mean, I think there's a case to be made that you probably won't have as much as you do in the fiat world. I, I, I make that argument, uh, quite, uh, in depth in my books that in a Bitcoin based economy, we're going to have a lot less debt than in a fiat economy, we might even have very little debt. But debt is not an end in itself. Nobody wants to be in debt for the sake of debt. The point of debt is a way of financing. And if we can find a way of financing that allows us to finance everything that we want to finance without having debt, then that would be good. And there is such a way, and that way is called equity financing. So if you have a business and you want money for that business, 
instead of borrowing at a fixed interest rate, you sell equity. And then the investor shares with you on the upside and in the downside. If you lose money, they lose money. If they make money, they make as much as you make or a certain whatever you agree to. But he's, he's sharing with you on the upside and on the downside. Now, if we live in a world in which we have uh, the distortion of fiat money, and so most people think that the current world is just the, you know, the normal, the healthy default state of affairs, I think the current world is a mess. And it is a mess because we use credit and debt as money. So the money that we use is government money, but it is debt. It is using debt as money. And because debt is money, the more... Uh, you generate debt the more money you have. And that's why everybody in this kind of world has an incentive to get into debt. That's why individuals buy their houses with debt. That's why companies finance their operation with debt. That's why governments are all in debt. Everybody's in debt. Because every time you get into debt, someone is creating new money. So as I call it in the fiat standard, my book, The Fiat Standard, in the fiat system, mining fiat is done by generating loans. When you're in, in, in gold, you dig the ground, you find new gold. With Bitcoin, you solve some mathematical problems and you find new Bitcoin. With uh, fiat money, you issue a loan and that creates new fiat. So therefore, banks, every time they create a loan, they make new money. And so, of course, they have a lot of interest in making that money. They make that money out of thin air, and then you give it to you, and you have to pay it back, and you have to pay it back with interest. So it's a very nice business model for them. And so, of course, they have, because they can destroy the money, the value of the money that everybody has when they issue debt, that gives them a very strong incentive to get into debt. And if you don't get into debt personally, you are subsidizing everybody who is getting into debt. So if you decide, I don't want to get into debt, I'm just going to save money. Well, every year, you know, you decide, I'm not going to buy a house with debt. I'm going to save money so that I can buy the house. Well, every year you accumulate savings and your savings are losing value. So the value, the price of the house is always going up and you're unable to catch up because the house is getting devalued. Why is the house getting devalued? Because every time somebody else buys a house, they get into debt. And when they get into that, what does the bank do? It issues new money. So new money is issued, and that's why the house is always getting more expensive. And effectively, if you're not getting into debt, you're just holding on to uh, fiat and saving it, you are subsidizing everybody else's home. You're holding the money that's being devalued so that other people can get cheap loans. So if you don't participate in the debt of slavery economy, you are subsidizing all of those people who are. And I think if you take away fiat money's uh, use as money and you take away the ability to generate money by creating debt, I don't think we'd have as much debt, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it would be a good thing. I think you will see businesses being financed through equity, and that's a good thing. So overall, you want, you want in a society less debt. You think that's healthy? I would say so, yeah. I, I, I read a book of Ray Dalio and he says that uh, debt is very healthy for long-term productivity to increase productivity. So you kind of against that argument. I disagree. And I think, I mean, I, I would agree in the sense that when you have a debt-based economy, then yes, it makes sense for you to get into debt because that's the best way to finance it. So if you run a business and you're trying to finance your business without getting into debt, you're going to have a bad time. You have to go through the banks. You have to run the business. So um, it is true in our current system, but I reject the idea that this is inevitable. And I reject the idea that it is good in the abstract. I think that if we had a form of money that was a free market money, that was a sound money, people would choose it freely. We'd have an economy that had a lot less debt. Okay, very interesting, very interesting. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the government. So you think uh, government without this fiat system that you have now is not powerful? Yes. Well, because currently governments are able to finance themselves, as I said, by just uh, creating new money. And as long as there is a functioning money in the society, they can continue to finance themselves at zero cost effectively until the currency breaks down. And then when the currency breaks down, 
the people in the government, of course, don't really suffer much. Everybody else is the people who suffer the most. So if you're in the government, you're not going to go hungry when the currency collapses, but normal people are going to go hungry. And so this is a very, very conducive system for government power and for government totalitarianism. Do you want to uh, impose your will on uh, the people? Yeah, very easy. Print money, pay the police and the army, and then they shoot people. It was much more difficult when you had to get your money from people. When you couldn't print money, when money was gold, you didn't have a magic printer. So you wanted to impose your will on people, something that they don't want. You had to first send your tax collectors to the people to take money from them. Then use that money to pay the soldiers to go and terrorize the people and shoot the people and kill them and tell them that they have to listen to what you have to say. So that's a lot more difficult because people don't like to turn over their money. They hide their money. They'll tell you, we don't have any more money. I I lost it. Um, You know, trying to interrogate every single one and trying to torture every single one to get their money out of them is just going to get more expensive than uh, the money that they have. The alternative is you just click a button and you have all the money that you want and you're robbing your citizens of their money without you having to go into their house, without you having to take the money because they have the money in the bank or they have it under the mattress, but you increase the supply of the money. So the value of the money that they have has gone down. You've declined, you've decreased the value of their savings and you've allowed yourself to finance yourself. And so governments all over the world love this. That's why they all love Keynes. They all teach Keynes because it's what they want to hear. Let's say we go to Mars now and you are going to develop a government uh, there. How do you develop uh, kind of a ruling system in a way that in your opinion? So for me, I don't believe that there is a necessity for a government system. Uh, For me, government is all coercion. Government refers to one person imposing his will on others. I don't think that that is necessary. I think anything that human beings want can be achieved consensually without coercion. In other words, you and I agree to the terms of our deal. You and I agree to what we want to do with one another, and therefore we can build whatever we want. So people want to build buildings. They want to make roads. They want to start factories. They want to grow food, all of those things. They don't need government. They need people to work. And what people need to work is to just agree with one another. So I will hire you. I'll pay you this much. You'll work for that much. And we agree to it. And then if you don't, if we disagree, then we part ways and I hire somebody else. So I don't really believe that there is a need for government per se. I think what is needed is an acceptance of property rights. People need to accept the concept of property rights. And if we're able to accept the concept of property rights, then we can have any kind of complex social organization that we want completely voluntarily. So I accept your property rights, you accept my property rights, and that includes the stuff that I own as well as my own body. And um, you accept that you cannot do anything with the things that I own or with my body without my permission. And I accept the same for you. If we have that as the organizing principle of uh, any kind of human society, I believe that that will result in peace, prosperity, and productivity. If, on the other hand, we believe that um, under certain conditions, property rights become invalid, that say, my religion is better than your religion, and so if I want your stuff, I can take your stuff because my God says so, or... If we believe that some group of people are allowed to break property rights, um, say the government is allowed to take anything from anybody because they're the government and they're important, then we just create the recipe for endless conflict between us. So why should you get to violate my rights? No, I want to violate your rights. And that's what we descend to in modern politics, where modern politics is a competition of who's going to violate other people's rights first. You know, my team is going to win the election and we're going to take your stuff. No, my team is going to win the election and we're going to take your stuff. And so we rally each other around each other in teams. You know, so our team wants to support these constituent groups at the expense of those. And your team wants to support those groups at the expense of these. And then we fight each other. And then whoever wins more votes, uh, whoever in the popularity contest that is democracy, has the right to violate others' property rights. 
I don't believe that that is a healthy way for a society to exist. I think you want a healthy, peaceful, prosperous society. You got to start from the starting point of accepting property rights. So maybe this was going to work easily in hunter-gatherer societies with small uh, groups. Do you think this can work in huge cities with 20, 30 million population, what you're describing? Yes. In fact, I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the cities that work today, they are closer to that than they are to being democracies. For instance, You look at cities like London, New York, Paris, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. I mean, <laughs> these, these cities are amazing. We grew up thinking about how amazing those places are. Our, our entire culture and life is about stories and novels and movies based in those cities. And everybody dreams about going and living there. But if you go there now... There is human feces on the street everywhere. People are fighting each other everywhere. People are killing each other. Crime is everywhere. These places are derelict and falling apart. But you look at places that are working. You, you look at, say, Dubai or Doha and Qatar. Um, you look at all these uh, cities. What do they have? Well, they are uh, monarchies. And then effectively, what a monarchy is, is the king owns pretty much everything and respects the property rights of others. So you can own property in Dubai, and your property is respected in Dubai better than it is in Chicago or in New York, because you have to pay 40, 50% taxes in New York or Chicago, and then those taxes go to finance corrupt politicians and government who get to um, abuse your rights in all kinds of different ways, and they have a lot of money, And the whole thing is built around a system where property rights are not clearly defined. Who owns the streets of Chicago? Well, it's the city and it's the state government or maybe the federal government, depending on the street, depending on this, depending on that. When you have a monarchy, it's like very clear. If it's not private property, if it's not yours or mine, then it's owned by the prince. And the prince gets to decide, or the king, and he gets to decide. And that's it. And life turns out a lot smoother in that way. Ultimately, you know, of course, you could have a despotic regime. So you can have a uh, North Korea or something like that. These are not monarchies, but they are despotic. And so um, you have an authoritarian regime that decides everything and confiscate property rights. The important thing for me, though, is property rights. If you respect property rights, you can have civilized society. If you don't respect property rights, we go back to being monkeys in the jungle. Uh, I recently sat down and watched a lot of talks of the previous uh, Sheikh of Dubai. And it's very interesting, like, because they are kind of monarchy, they were able to, uh, to make all this stuff. If they were a democracy, they were going to have friction to doing, uh, being efficient. So uh, <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> But it's very crazy when you said to Lex Fried, When you said to Lex Friedman that you, uh, that you said, uh, that you like, uh, enlightened monarchy, he was like, he couldn't believe it. <laughs> It's a strange, uh, thought in 2024. <laughs> it is, it is, but I think more and more people are going to start like coming to terms with it. I mean, uh, I think my favorite example of this is, uh, in, in the Middle East, say people in uh, Lebanon, for instance, this is a great example. So many people in Lebanon leave Lebanon and go and work in uh, Dubai, in the Emirates, and Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. And in Lebanon, you talk to those people, and their lives are so um, re- fixated around local politics. It, local politics is such a big deal. The local politics of Lebanon are, are such a huge deal, and it's such a bitter conflict, and you know, it's, 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 it's mixed with... Um, religious problems and historical problems and it's all a democracy and they have voting and every election is paralysis for the entire country and people are always crazy about what's going on and people get really uh, hateful of one another, my team versus your team. And then the vast majority of people are laughing on it when offered the chance to go and live in Dubai. They will jump at it. They will not miss that chance. They will leave and they will go to Dubai. And they go to Dubai 
And they live in a place where there is no democracy. There are no elections. There is no politics. There is no such thing as you expressing your opinion in politics. You go to Dubai, you work as an engineer, turn up every morning and you work as an engineer. Nobody gives uh, any interest to what your opinions are about how the country should be run. You don't get to make any kind of um, statements about, well, we should uh, build roads here or we shouldn't build roads there or uh, the prince should be paid this much or the prince shouldn't be paid that much or we should have a parliament where I get to run for parliament. None of that, none of that stuff. And nobody even considers that. I mean, I I like to ask people who are fans of democracy this and to sort of trigger their uh, cognitive dissonance, like, why aren't you politically active in Dubai? Why did you just go there, work and live happily and prosper and save money and enjoy safe streets, enjoy peace, enjoy prosperity, enjoy clean uh, streets, enjoy infrastructure, enjoy 24 hour electricity. And it doesn't require you to do any politics. And then you go back to Lebanon <laughs> and you have no electricity, you have no clean streets, you have crime, you have violence, you have uh, interreligious conflict, and you have very strong opinions about politics. Now, why don't you draw the connection? I mean, wouldn't Lebanon be better off if the royal family of the Emirates just took over Lebanon and ran it like it ran Dubai, and everybody in Lebanon just shut up and stopped having one of their opinions. I mean, as long as the ruling family would respect people's property rights, and so people would have the right to own their land, to own their businesses, to keep their income, and people will have the right to hold their own religious beliefs and uh, practice those religious beliefs, which you can do in the Emirates, then why would you even want any of this politics? And so for me, I think we're going to see this more and more. And I think the, the, the Gulf and the Middle East is, is a great example. You look at where places like Dubai and Qatar are today. I mean, Qatar organized a whole World Cup in one city. It's just completely unimaginable anywhere else in the world. It's, it's a, no other city in the world could organize a World Cup. A World Cup requires you to have eight to ten giant stadia. No city can have eight to ten large stadia in the same place and have the infrastructure to accommodate the fans going from one stadium to the other and to their hotels. They can pull it off in Qatar and they can do it with a monarchy and they can do it with exactly zero democracy and zero um, uh, participation by um, individuals. And yet it works. And I think the future is going to head us, is going to head more and more toward this direction. Uh, there's a great book by the Prince of Liechtenstein. His name is Prince Hans Adam of Liechtenstein. I wrote a great book called The State in the Third Millennium. And in this book, he explains how he views the best way for the government to lead to more freedom in the 21st century, the way that uh, the world's becoming more free. People require more freedom. They want more freedom. And people are capable of supporting more freedom because people are more educated and they better understand um, the world around them. And so we're heading to world of war and, uh, we're heading towards a world of more freedom. As people's productivity increases, their income increases, their freedom increases. But there are two ways of going about this. On the one hand, you have the um, conventional way that you keep hearing about from politics all over the world, which is we need more democracy, more participation. We need uh, everybody to be involved in the decision-making process. But he suggests something different. He suggests less participation and of the people in the uh, government's decisions, but government would have more, uh, so government would have more executive power, but people would have the right to secede and exit, and people would have the right to choose which political entities they want to be part of. I think this is a much more efficient way of organizing things, and this is this is how everything that works in your life. This is I'm, how it's done. I'm not sure if I under. I'm not sure if I understood what you said. Now with the, if you can repeat it. Yeah. So look at look at the laptop that you're using right now. Let's say it's an Apple laptop. It's produced by Apple. Did you vote for the design of the laptop? No. Did you vote for the engineers who designed it? No. Did you vote for the CEO? No. 
Do you have any kind of input into the production of this laptop that you're using? Absolutely not. And yet it works great uh, for a $2,000 or whatever. You have this incredible machine that can do all kinds of amazing things for you. Everything that works in your life was produced this way, not because you participated. It's because you relied on experts who know what they're doing. You relied on engineers and CEOs and uh, experts on marketing, experts in uh, welding, experts in semiconductor production. All of those people know their job. They don't need you to tell them how to do their job. The only thing that you want And the only thing that you need is the ability to not take their product if you don't like it. This is the only thing that Apple needs from you in order for them to function properly. The only thing that you need in order for Apple to produce the great products that they produce is that you have the choice, if you don't like their laptop, to go and buy a laptop from somebody else. That's it. And so that's how all of these companies are able to stay productive, how they're all able to stay profitable. They're constantly competing for you. And the way that they compete is by offering you a better product. And so that's the model that works for everything that works in our life, everything that works. The reason your clothes are made is not because you participated in a political process in your uh, clothes manufacturer. It's because you have choice. The reason your laptop works is because you have choice. All of those things. It's not participation, it's choice. It's not your voice, it's not your ability to speak that got you. It's your exit, the chance for you to exit. The fact that you can stop buying Apple is why Apple is constantly making better machines. Because if they stop, if they start slacking, if they don't figure it out, you're just going to go somewhere else. So what Prince Hans Adam is saying is that this is where we need to go with government. If to the extent that you believe that government is needed in order to provide some kind of services that are by their nature um, almost limited or uh, into a kind of one um, monopoly provider, say, for instance, uh, the road network in a city. You can have private roads, but also, I mean, one way in which it can be done is that there's a private city where the owner of the city builds the city and the owner of the city builds the roads. And then you have the choice of using those roads and living in that city or moving to another city. Simply having the choice is much more valuable than being part of a democratic process. And I think, you know, try and imagine what would happen if Apple was building its iPhones with a democratic process where 51% of Apple users needed to approve the engineer who was going to do it. 51% needed to approve the design. 51% needed to approve the features that were going to be added. If you try to do this, I mean, iPhones would never get built. And when they get built, they're going to be absolutely horrible because you're trying to design something with the input of people that are not designers and with goals that are contradictory. You know, so I want a big screen and you want a keyboard that's easy to click. So uh, we can't have both. You, you can't have the whole machine be a screen and also have a keyboard on it. So then we uh, get into interminable conflict and interminable drama and endless politics and the phones suck. Just give the CEO and the engineers all the authority they want and all the power they want and you get to choose. And that's, I think, the way that uh, it would work best. And I think... Naturally, the world is going to go more toward that if the world becomes more of a Bitcoin world rather than a fiat world, because the fiat world is what gives those governments all this money and all this power and therefore makes politics so important because the people that are in power just have an override button for everything that takes place in society. They can take all of your money. They can confiscate everything because they have infinite power because of the money. Take that away. They go back to being humans like us. They're just service providers. And I think the most efficient way of having them become service providers is to just hold them accountable by having the right to exit. Okay. So just to rephrase for me to make sure that they understand. So you're saying uh, private companies kind of will be the rulers of cities. And if you don't like them, you're going to go to the next city and having an exit choice. Kind of, this is what you're referring to. This basically, yes. And it doesn't just have to be cities, but like all kind of, um, all kind of the uh, entities, 
political construct. So you can see it, the small states, large states, maybe small states will secede out of large states. Um, and I think the key thing is that he, uh, what, what the way that Hans Adam describes it is that you want to have the right of self-determination down to the level of the neighborhood or the small village. So a small village can decide we want to be part of this country or we want to be part of that other country or we want to just separate and become our own country. I think if this was respected, I think if we accept, if, if we developed a culture where everybody accepted this idea that you don't own other people, you just accepted the radical notion that other people are not your property for you to choose what to do with them. And therefore, other people get to choose if they want to be part of your political system or not. If we had that, then I think the world would be a lot better. In other words, think of a Europe. Instead of having one European Union, uh, we need a Europe of 1,000 Liechtensteins. Tiny little countries, tiny little principalities, where people are free to enter into those arrangements and leave them. So a uh, small little town in Switzerland decides, no, you know what? We don't want to be part of Switzerland. We want to be part of Germany. Or maybe we want to join with another 15 towns in this area and become our own little country. Or Germany maybe breaks down into smaller and smaller political entities. And and, and I think if you had that, you'd have a lot better um, uh, protection of property. You'd have a lot more peace. The society would be a lot more prosperous. What's your thoughts on Europe? Um, what... A part of Europe. What about Europe? Uh, Europe things. as a whole, because by the way, I'm, I'm running for, uh, to become, uh, MEP uh, in my country that I'm going to represent my country in Europe now in the elections. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, uh, Europe as a whole. Uh, if you think it's successful, if you think it's, uh, it's not successful, if you think, yeah, or thoughts. Well, you mean Europe or the European Union? European Union, European Union. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, the European Union, I'm not a fan of. I'm a big fan of Europe as a continent, as a place. I love going to Europe. I love traveling around Europe. I love Europe's old cities. I love spending a lot of time there. I think uh, the geography of Europe is just uh, very unique. It's, it's, it's a great place. I love the Mediterranean. My, the Mediterranean is my favorite place in the world. So you and Cyprus, I'm sure you love it too. It's a beautiful place. I, and I think, of course, European culture, European civilization, European history is enormously valuable, enormously uh, consequential for humanity. And it's been a blessing for humanity that Europe has produced all of the amazing things that it has produced over the past few centuries. Everything from industrialization to technology, to literature, to art, to architecture, to all these incredible cathedrals. So there's a lot that I love about Europe. Of course, European football as well. I'm a huge fan of European football. I'm big uh, on that. So a lot to love about Europe, but the European Union is not one of those things. I am not a fan of the European Union at all. I'm not a fan of um, centralizing large political structures. Um, I think you want to have uh, politics become more and more local and more and more decentralized. And uh, no, I don't... I mean, I, I, my preference is for this, but primarily my preference is for self-determination. So people as part of a big entity decide that they want to be part of a big entity. That's perfectly fine with me. But the European Union is not very good at that. Um, it's, uh, I mean, you could argue that yeah, Britain voted to exit and they kind of did exit. So it does respect the right of secession to a point. There is a uh, point to that. But I mean, the way that the European Union operates is that it overrules all kind of uh, local politics. And it's, uh, it's got enormous power because it has its own central bank and it prints its own money. And so it can impose its will on society very strongly. And it just continues to get more and more powerful. One good thing about it, of course, is that it has opened up trade in Europe. I think this has been massively um, beneficial to people of Europe and everybody in the world. The fact that Europe is one open market where goods travel around between the European countries without um, complications is hugely beneficial to the people of Europe and everybody in the world. Everybody benefits from the fact that, say, uh, German manufacturing companies are able to import things from France for free without having to go through customs duties. 
that makes German production more efficient, makes French production more efficient, and helps everybody by making cars more efficient. So that part of it I like. Um, but I think a better uh, political system would be one that tends toward more and more secession, self-determination, and then people would be able to draw up their own own rules. And I think that would avoid a lot of conflict because people would naturally sort themselves into um, communities that match their own values. And so things become a lot less contentious. We don't need to have one uh, European industrial policy, one European migration policy, one European policy on uh, one European monetary policy. All of these things become local. And so people who want to live in societies that have a lot of migrants will get together and live in places that respect, uh, that, that welcome migrants. People who don't want to do that will live in places that don't welcome migrants. And over time, I think this is better. Whatever your view is, whatever your view is on the issue of migration or fiscal policy or industrial policy, or whatever it is, having that variety where you have all these, say, 1,000 Liechtensteins across Europe trying all of these different policies is a lot better because people will see, you know, we tried this kind of fiscal policy and it caused all, all the, all of the Liechtensteins that are trying this are failing. All the Liechtensteins that are trying that are succeeding. So your little principality wants to follow the model that is working better. So I think this competition would generate a lot of benefits. And all of that is lost when you put everything into one giant uh, uh, centralized bureaucracy. So you are referring to the feedback loop that you're going to be improving a lot more faster. You're going to be failing a lot more faster and improving a lot more faster. And that's why it's great to divide all these things into smaller parts and let them improve by itself. And you accumulate all the knowledge of wisdom of the crowds kind of. Basically, yes. Ultimately, what matters is that people have the ability to opt in or opt out to the arrangements that they want. And because you have private property, people are free to bear the consequences. So you benefit from making the right choice, you lose from making the wrong choice. When you have a big giant bureaucracy with one unelected, unaccountable person in charge, actually, even if they're elected, doesn't change much. As long as it's a bureaucracy that has the money, uh, that has the ability to print money, it doesn't matter how much they mess up. They are going to be fine. People in power are always the last to suffer the consequences. The bigger the bureaucracy, the bigger the country, the bigger the political entity, the more room for separating the people in power from the consequences of their decisions. That's why it's much more likely that you're going to get something like a Stalin in something as big as the Soviet Union, but you're not going to get a Stalin in something like Switzerland or Schleswig-Holstein or these tiny little uh, communities. Because, uh, I mean, everybody meets in the church on the Friday, uh, on the Sunday. Everybody goes to the same church on Sunday. They meet and uh, people talk and people can see the consequences of their actions. But if, you, if you're if you ruling over an empire of 500 million people, you're not going to get to see them. You live in your own world. You're separated from the people that you rule over. And you have a money printer, so you don't need to even care about what they say or think. One thing that you said really stuck to my mind. Basically, when we have democracy, their motives of the politician is to divide the people, is to make, uh, so their motive is to divide the people. So this is what we get by democracy, divided people. Very true. In comparison to Dubai, that there is no politics. <laughs> Absolutely. I think this is something that is, um, and it's getting worse and worse because of, um, media and technology allowing people to just be engaged in this stuff all the time and allowing the kind of worst, uh, instincts of people to surface to this, to surface to the top. So you see this like in a place like the U.S. I mean, it's, it's unbearable being in the U.S. around election time. I, I, I it's, it's, it's unbearable. Everybody is obsessed with their favorite team and everybody is just so, fixated on how bad the other people are. And it's just extremely tiresome to be subjected to that. And it's extremely destructive. I mean, 
you hear so many stories about relationships falling apart because of politics, family falling apart because of politics. Brothers and sisters don't talk to each other because one is a Democrat and the other one is a Republican. And um, friendships break down, offices break down, work falls apart. Everything is falling apart because everybody wants to be king. Everybody gets to play king and everybody thinks their opinion is king. And then you give them this idea that, you know, you get to vote and you get to decide what's going to happen in the future. And it goes to their head and they get self-righteous about it. And we are the good team and you are the bad team. And the only reason anybody would vote for your team is they must be evil. And the only smart thing to do is to just vote for my team. And then with that kind of thing, everybody just becomes angry at everybody else at And one of the biggest things we are wasting our energy, the finite time that we have, the currency is time. So when we are against each other and when we are talking about this stuff, is we are losing time for being productive, doing other things, learning. Uh, it's bad for society probably wasting this energy. Absolutely. And then you travel to a place like Dubai and you just don't see any of that. Nobody cares. Nobody pays attention. And guess what? They have 24 hour electricity. They've got infrastructure that works. Everything works. They've turned a piece of desolate desert into the most or one of the most important cities in the world where people from all over the world want to migrate. I mean, people from every part of the world, from Latin America, from China, from North America, from Australia, from Europe, from Africa, from all over Asia, people want to go to Dubai because it has best tax laws, best corporate laws. It has the best Uh, environment for setting up a business and all of that is done without people having to uh, fight each other over democracy uh, let's get into a, a new topic and forgive me because I'm going to ask some very basic stupid questions so what is Bitcoin <laughs> what is Bitcoin Bitcoin is software this is the most important thing to realize Bitcoin is a form of software And it's a form of software that allows its users to operate a payment network between one another. And uh, this is payment network. This payment network is extremely important. Uh, this technology is, this software is extremely important for two primary reasons. Number one, the payment network operates in a way that is uncensorable. In other words, anybody in the world can choose to use this and nobody can stop you. If you decide that you want to trade uh, on Bitcoin, you can download the software. Anyone can download it online. You can run it on your computer and you can send money and nobody, no authority can tell you, no, you cannot do that. That's the first thing that's so important about it. And the second thing that's really important about it, the thing that I really am fascinated and fixated with, is the fact that it is the first money, the, the payment network runs on a form of money. It is the first money that humanity has ever witnessed that is strictly fixed in its supply. It's finite. There's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin ever. So, so the combination between the two makes the perfect uh, currency, that we, the best currency that we ever had in the world? Yeah, I think this is why I call Bitcoin the most advanced technology for performing the functions of money. I think you can think of every other money as being an inferior, imperfect uh, Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin comes about and finally... Um, delivers the what I would describe as the uh, hypothetically perfect money. It's the theoretically perfect money. This is the money that you would want. I'd always, um, not always, but even before Bitcoin came about, I was, in my mind, I knew that the best form of money would be a form of money that would be fixed in quantity. But no such thing was possible because there's no possibility, at least at that point, I thought there's no possibility that you could create a form of money whose supply cannot be increased. If you, and, and, uh, whatever form of money you, t uh, you, you create, somebody's going to find a way to make more of it. And then Bitcoin comes about and somebody found a way to not make more of it. How, how does Bitcoin work? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. It's going to be impossible for me to explain how Bitcoin works in one podcast. It's not something that's very simple. The operation is not simple. And uh, it's something that requires a significant amount of time to be studied. So um, the answer here is a little bit like, well, you know, how does your refrigerator work? Explain it to you. <laughs> I don't think you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
You can't explain it, and yet every day you eat food that comes from it. Wow. <laughs> what an answer. <laughs> what a w- or what a way to avoid to answer. <laughs> I mean, I can, I, I can, um, I mean, I have like three chapters in my book to try and explain how Bitcoin works, but it's really difficult to explain it from scratch. Um, I guess if I wanted to just kind of, uh, give a brief overview, the key idea is that this software, what this software does. So you download the Bitcoin software and there is a ledger of balances in, uh, the Bitcoin currency. So we have 21 million Bitcoins. And if you want to understand Bitcoin, think about it as like a game, a multi, uh, uh, multiplayer game played by um, millions of people all over the world. And every 10 minutes, all that this game does is that every 10 minutes, we are producing an inventory of all 21 million Bitcoins. So currently, there's only 19 and a half million Bitcoin. There's about one and a half million that are going to be produced over the next uh, century or so. So every 10 minutes, we produce an inventory of the Bitcoins. So this address has this many Bitcoin. That address has that many Bitcoin. And then during those 10 minutes, people from people are going to send some of their Bitcoins from my address to yours. And then the next 10 minutes, we're going to have to produce a new inventory where I took out three Bitcoins from my balance. And now there are three more Bitcoins in your balance. So every 10 minutes, we upgrade this inventory. And we upgraded all jointly. The, the unique thing about it is that tens of thousands of computers around the world are upgrading the same ledger every 10 minutes and are able to arrive at the distribution of the coins. And they manage to do that without having to rely on any particular authority. So it isn't that there is a Mr. Bitcoin in the middle who is in charge or there is a no CEO of Bitcoin who is in charge who every 10 minutes decides, all right, this is the new inventory of the coins this address has that much and that address has this much. And if there is a conflict, say, between my version and your version, we just go to the CEO and we ask the CEO which one is correct. And then the CEO decides you're right, I'm wrong. There is no CEO. There is no central authority. And yet every 10 minutes, everybody arrives at the same consensus, which is this is how much Bitcoin there is in this address and this is how much Bitcoin in that address Everybody's able to arrive at this every 10 minutes because of the unique technology of how Bitcoin works. And so all that we're doing is every 10 minutes, we're looking at all the coins. We're looking at an inventory of all the coins, and we're also adding new coins. Currently, every 10 minutes, we add six and a quarter coins. In a few weeks, it's going to drop by half from six and a quarter to 3.1 coins. And this is the rate at which we go. Every four years, we continue to drop by half. So initially, we used to add 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes with every block. Then four years later, it became 25 Bitcoins every block. And then four years later, it became 12 and a half every block. And then four years later, it became six and a quarter. And now, next month, this um, in April, depends on when you air this, this month, if it's, this is airing in April, in around April 20th, it's going to drop from six and a quarter to three point one Bitcoins every block. So that's it. Every 10 minutes, we uh, make a new amount of Bitcoin that gets added to the supply. And we tally all of the Bitcoins and figure out where they are. And then within those next 10 minutes, people make their transactions. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, we agree. So by doing this, we're running this ledger that is uh, allowing us to see how um, trade is taking place between everybody. And that effectively allows us to operate a payment ledger internationally at a speed that is incomparable to um, other alternatives because this one provides you with final settlement. So you can't compare this to a credit card payment or a um, MasterCard or Visa payment because MasterCard or Visa payment takes months until they can track it back or they can always uh, charge back. This is final settlement of 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 money. So the money is sent and that's it. And then there's no recourse for you to get it back. Why a government cannot shut it down? The simple reason is that Bitcoin is an extremely simple piece of software. It's just very simple code. And all it does is that it checks what is happening every 10 minutes and arrives at this new ledger. So There is no critical infrastructure that is needed for Bitcoin to operate. There's no headquarters. If you bomb the headquarters, you destroy Bitcoin. 
As I said, there's no CEO, so there's no guy that you can kill and then you're growing Bitcoin. There's no server anywhere in the world. There's no satellite anywhere in the world that is required for Bitcoin to operate. Bitcoin is uh, just a software that can be run on any of of the many billions of machines around the world that people are using. So you can run it on your phone, you can run it on your laptop, you can run it on desktop. And think about how many billions of these things are out there. They could all run Bitcoin. And all they do is just run this software to keep uh, updates, to keep the updated tally of all the coins floating around. And so the, in order to stop machines from doing that, in order to stop computers from just getting together and sharing a ledger with one another, you need to destroy the capability of computers communicating with one another all over the world. There's no other way. As long as people have computers and have internet, anyone can take any computer and uh, with encrypted signals as well and use Bitcoin. So you can't stop people from sharing a database. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And so um, if... As long as computers continue to exist and as long as people have these protocols for trading information, uh, for sending and receiving information between computers, which is the Internet, then anybody can use a computer, log on to the Internet, upgrade the ledger and trade with the others and keep track of all the coins that are on the network. So that's really why it is so difficult. And then the other thing is that even if you do, so hypothetically, people say, well, okay, well, let's, let's shut down the internet. Well, okay, two problems here. First of all, if you shut down the internet, you're going to have a lot bigger problems than Bitcoin. So your bank and your central bank and your hospital and your firefighting service and all of the critical infrastructures that you rely on for your life, they're going to... Map- the whole society will collapse Exactly. All of society will collapse and Bitcoin won't <laughs> because, yeah, even if you shut down the Internet, say, for a week, and nobody on Earth has access to the Internet. And or, I mean, even then, you can't really shut down the Internet because the Internet doesn't really have a central switch. There's no, again, also with the Internet, it's not like there's a central switch that somebody can flick. And then the Internet no longer works because the Internet is a protocol that anybody can do with their computer. So. Your computer and my computer, we connect to each other through wires or through wireless service. And we establish this protocol for trading data. And now we can share that ledger with one another. But even hypothetically assuming they manage to find a way to prevent computers to connect from one another, or they confiscate all the world's computers for a week so that nobody can do Bitcoin anymore. First of all, there's going to be the massive societal collapse that we discussed. If you don't have your computer, you know, everything's going to fall apart. Airplanes will start falling from the sky and hospitals will shut down and all kinds of terrible things will happen. But then after this week is over and people can get back online and we reinvent the Internet. Well, guess what? Bitcoin is still there. The Bitcoins that you owned are still there. So you had a certain balance of Bitcoin attached to your address. We're still there. We just pick up where we left off. And we continue to trade the coins amongst themselves. So you can't really destroy Bitcoin. At best, you can freeze it for a while, even assuming enormously unlikely and unfathomable uh, government power shutting down the internet, preventing people from using the internet. Even if you did do something like this, you'd still only manage to freeze Bitcoin. And then as soon as inter- the internet is reinvented, The balances are still there and we can pick off right where we left off. So, which you can't say about your central bank or your banking system or your hospital or your airplanes. They're going to fall apart if you take away their uh, internet connection. And they're going to not be easy to put back together. Whereas Bitcoin is just going to be frozen and it will resume when people want to resume it. Uh, what do you think about the criticism that Bitcoin gets about not healthy for the environment? I think it's nonsense. It's ridiculous. Um, first of all, I think the entire idea that uh, burning uh, hydrocarbon fuels is ruining the environment is ridiculous. Um, carbon dioxide is not the control knob for the Earth's temperature. The climate is an enormously complex phenomenon. And it is affected by all kinds of phenomena. I think the most important phenomena for human climate is the sun. And I urge you to 
look at the difference when uh, the sun is hitting the earth versus when it is not, as in day and night. The difference is literally day and night. Figuratively, we say it, but it's also very true. I mean, temperature will change by 10, 20, sometimes 30, maybe even 40 degrees overnight in some places because of the difference of the sun hitting the earth. And the idea that carbon dioxide emissions going from 200 particulates per million to 400 parts per million over 200 years is going to affect the Earth's climate and temperature is ridiculous. It's it's completely baseless. There's no uh, truth to it. There's no evidence to support it. It's just one of these insane things that are believed in universities run on fiat money. So there is no climate crisis. There is no climate emergency. There's no big giant problem with our climate that is being uh, caused by us staying warm in the winter and us having electricity and us having cars to move us around. In fact, the dangers of the environment are a lot more serious when we don't have those things. When we don't have energy, then we have environmental crisis. If you don't have hydrocarbon fuels to keep you warm in the winter, every winter is an environmental crisis. If you don't have hydrocarbon fuels to allow us to move around, then food becomes extremely expensive and difficult to provoke, to provide, and we have a crisis. So the real environmental crisis is what would happen if we weren't using the fuels that make our modern life possible. I think Earth would have a tiny fraction of the population that it currently has. So Bitcoin consumes a lot of energy, and I don't see that as a bad thing. I don't think it's a problem. I think energy consumption is good for humanity. The more energy we have, the better off we are. And the more energy we are able to utilize in meeting our needs, the happier we will be. So I don't see any problem with Bitcoin's energy consumption. How do you see the future of Bitcoin? I believe Bitcoin is just going to continue to increase in value and more and more people are going to understand it. Um, People misunderstand it. People have all kinds of misconception about Bitcoin. There's an enormous amount of misinformation about Bitcoin, deliberate misinformation, of course, because Bitcoin threatens the most powerful uh, entities in the world, central banks. Their ability to rob society is threatened by your ability to have an exit. As the Christine Lagarde said, if there is an exit, it will be used. And she's correct. If people have a way of opting out of being robbed by the Christine Lagarde and her cronies, people will find that way and they will use it. So, of course, governments and government media and government universities and government-funded uh, academics are constantly talking about how Bitcoin is bad, Bitcoin has failed, Bitcoin is going to ruin the weather, Bitcoin is going to collapse, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to happen. Uh, people are just going to continue to see that, hmm, they've been telling me Bitcoin is going to collapse since Bitcoin was at $100 and here we are at $70,000. Maybe those people whom I believed are idiots and maybe I should look into Bitcoin. And eventually they're going to look into Bitcoin and they're going to realize, oh, wow, this makes a lot more sense than the stupid fiat money that we are using. And then you start thinking, well, those people lied to me about money. I wonder what else they might have lied to me about. And that's when the fall down the Bitcoin rabbit hole really uh, accelerates. (laughs) Do you have any Bitcoin? No. (laughs) Are you serious? Yes, I do. Oh, you have? Of course I do. Yeah, I mean, it's... uh... (laughs) Yes, yes, I'm joking. You know, there's a saying among Bitcoiners. That was the best joke I heard in my life. In the, rule, <laughs> the first rule of Bitcoin is you always talk about Bitcoin. The second rule of Bitcoin is you never talk about your Bitcoins. Yeah. You just talk about Bitcoin in general, Bitcoin itself, cool, but not your Bitcoin. Can you tell me, uh, out of curiosity, what was the... Time that you bought your first Bitcoin? What uh, year? <laughs> okay. I don't talk about my Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm curious to see how early you got in. It's, it's interesting. But anyway, I, I accept your uh, your. I thought you were not early enough for me to not work. What? Yeah. Not, not early enough for me to not work. But oh. I still have to work. It's not early enough for me to not work. 
Okay, cool. So what do, uh, what do you think, since we are talking about the future of Bitcoin, what do you think about quantum computing and the threat that people say that will uh, be able to kind of break uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, I don't really, um, I don't really see this as being a very um, serious threat. I think, to be honest, the um, the uh, I think the technical aspect of it suggests that there isn't anything near that threatens Bitcoin. Also. I still think if you can do quantum computing, then this changes nothing about the way that Bitcoin functions. In other words, if you can do quantum, if, if quantum computing can break regular computer encryption, then it won't be able to break quantum encryption. So we can, you know, just like we can develop quantum decryption, we can develop quant, we will develop also quantum encryption. And there's always going to be this kind of um, um, asymmetry between the um, between the amount of energy and computing power required to encrypt something and the amount required to decrypt something. I don't think you will change that if you introduce quantum computing. But who will do this? And secondly, but, I think but, quantum computing. Uh, so, sorry for disturbing you, but who will do this? Since there is no CEOs, there is no one person to fix this kind of well i think if bitcoin faced some kind of existential threat then it would be uh straightforward relatively for members of the network to agree on the best way forward for addressing that in other words there's nobody in charge which is what guarantees that it's not possible for you to go and change the rules But if it was necessary to change the rules then you'll find that there'll be plenty of people who make proposals and I think we'll be able to arrive at the most suitable proposal uh, to change this. So if people agree to change Bitcoin, they can't change Bitcoin. Yes. It's just software. Anyone can change it. But why they don't change it now? Because you need to convince everybody else to change it in the same way that you want to change it. And why would people listen to you? Majority or everybody else that has Bitcoin? Pretty much everybody else. Everybody else who uses Bitcoin uh, has to use the same kind of uh, consensus rules. Now, who determines those consensus rules is pretty much just, it's, it's up to you. I mean, you decide to run whatever consensus rules you want. And so you could end up on another network other than Bitcoin. And that's what is different from Bitcoin. If you decide to adopt other consensus rules. Interesting. Uh, you started talking about two or uh, two things. Oh, balloons. <laughs> when it comes to uh, the, um, well, when it comes to the issue of quantum computing, I think quantum computing also, there's good reason to be skeptical that it's um, going to be quite as a revolutionary as it is marketed. We've been hearing for many, many years that, you know, quantum computing are going to arrive and they're going to change everything. It's like nanotechnology or quantum computing or uh, blockchain technology. You keep hearing those buzzwords. It's not very clear what they're going to be doing and how they're going to affect things. So um, I think it's rather telling that when you mention Bitcoin, people bring up all these fantasy sci-fi scenarios for how Bitcoin is going to fail. You know, the governments are going to shut down the internet everywhere and do all kinds of insane things or new quantum computing is going to be discovered that's going to destroy Bitcoin. Well, if that's going to happen, it's going to destroy all the banks and the central banks and uh, everything else and your health records and the airplanes. And we're, uh, Bitcoin is going to be the least of our problems if uh, this is going to be the case. But... I think what's really fascinating is that the people promoting these ideas, the people that are constantly telling you about, well, oh, this is um, dangerous, this is a problem, this is a big deal. <laughs> I mean, they are telling you this about Bitcoin while continuing to use and promote their government money, which is doesn't require fantasy sci-fi for it to fail. It is failing today. It's failing every day. And it will continue to fail. Somewhere, someone is suffering from hyperinflation today. And 
the majority of the world is suffering from very high inflation and everybody in the world is suffering from at least some inflation, even in the most advanced, best monetary policy countries in the world, fiat money is failing. So it's similar to a situation where you are on a boat that is sinking and you, and you know, Bitcoin is this lifeboat that is working fine and people have been using it for 15 years and your boat is sinking. But you have people on the sinking boat telling you, no, 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 we're not going to go to the lifeboat. What if <laughs> there is some magic force of the universe that comes and invents a magical quantum computer that destroys your safety boat? Okay, stay on the sinking boat. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> what about all the other coins, Ethereum and all these things? Uh, what is your thoughts about this? There are no other coins. There is no second best, as Michael Saylor puts it. There is no second best. There's Bitcoin and then there's shitcoin. Everything else is an indistinguishable lump of shitcoins. Uh, they do not matter. The only one that matters is Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the only one that has rules that are not up for everybody to change. There is no authority in charge that can change the supply of Bitcoin. There is an authority in charge that can change the supply of every single other currency out there. And so whenever you're buying any one of the other currencies, you are buying a promise from the people in charge of it that they're not going to change the rules in a way that is bad for you. And the vast majority of those promises have turned out to be false so far. The vast majority of those coins have been hard forked. They have had changed the rules. They have dumped uh, their pre-mine. They've increased the supply beyond what they had agreed to or what they had said they would do. It's all up in the air and it's basically just buying an entry on somebody's private database. And at any point in time, they could change their database and they could take away everything from you or take away a big chunk of what you have. Bitcoin is the only one where you're not buying something from people. It's not a security. It's not someone issuing it. It's like a commodity. It's a commodity because anybody can mine it, anybody can sell it, anybody can produce it, anybody can buy it, anybody can do whatever they want with it, and there is no authority in charge. Everything else is a security. Everything else is just some person issuing a uh, legal liability. Now, with the case of digital currencies, it's they're issuing securities, but without having any kind of uh, adherence to the laws for security. So this is why it's attractive. It's a way to get around securities law currently. And that's really what it's all about. It's just an arbitrage around security law. Now, one of two things is going to happen to this kind of business model. A, one possibility is that they get shut down by governments. The governments are uh, can, cramp, can clamp down on these uh, coins. And I think that's entirely feasible because they're all centralized. They all have authorities in charge of them and the authorities can be forced to change the rules by governments. So that's one possibility of what might happen. The second possibility is that if they don't clamp down on them, then that's going to effectively end uh, the uh, securities law. It's going to make a mockery of securities law. And then in that case, without securities law, then anyone can launch a security and then these coins become uninteresting and unimportant. So there is... Uh, the, uh, I can't see this kind of uh, unique position where we are right now, where there is securities law and uh, shitcoins are a way to get around securities law. I don't see this lasting for long. I think we're going to shift back to uh, either everybody issues securities, in which case these things become unimportant, or we reinforce securities law and these things become illegal. But they're not... Um, censorship resistance, they can be shut down and they do not have a future. So I do not recommend any other currency. And I sleep very comfortably at night knowing that I never told anybody to get into any one of those currencies. And I think that's a good thing. But you got a lot of people into Bitcoin, which you probably made them a lot of money. <laughs> I think so. I hope so. Yeah, I mean, uh, my book has now been up to, uh, for uh, my book has been out for six years now, and it's up. Uh, the price of Bitcoin is up around tenfold since then. 
Yes. So uh, I, ha- I wanted to tell you something. So before I started this podcast, I was talking with uh, uh, this podcast now. Uh, my friend texted me. He knew that I will have you as a guest. And he said, I'm so happy. Tell him that I said that he, you, you consider yourself as an anarchist, as I understand. Yeah, people generally tend to think of anarchism as being, you know, a bunch of hooligans who want to smash things. No, my vision of anarchy is, uh, anarchism is basically a peaceful society that is civilized, where people think of the long term and plan for the long term and the property rights are secure. That's what anarchy is for me. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I give you one trillion dollars. How do you spend it to fa- to have maximum impact, positive impact in the world? Buy Bitcoin. I buy Bitcoin with it all. And then I spend it slowly on uh, things that I believe are worthwhile. Because I think if you, if you, if I have a trillion dollars, I'd be, you, you start buying Bitcoin with a trillion dollars, the price of Bitcoin is going to go to the moon. It's going to go up enormously. And the Bitcoiners will become very wealthy. And I believe that's going to make the world a lot better. It's going to raise the value of Bitcoin enormously. So Bitcoin will become bigger than national currencies. And so Bitcoiners will be able to affect the world more than governments because governments' money is going to be losing value a lot and it's going to be worth a lot, a lot less. And so central banks are going to be powerless. Governments are going to be powerless. And um, the world will be an infinitely better place. Bitcoin's price goes up. And then um, how would I spend the money? I don't have very strong opinions about how to spend money in a way that will make the world a better place. There, obviously, there are the obvious uh, answers of you know, charity and um, building schools, building hospitals and so on. So yeah, you could do that, but of course, uh, there is there are also the problems associated with that. Where in it sounds a lot simpler than it actually is in reality. So it costs a lot of money to build an actual hospital, um, but it's a it's it's challenging. It's more challenging than the money is having the hospital run efficiently and effectively. Especially because if you just pay for a hospital and the hospital doesn't need to generate its own income then that's very difficult for them to develop the discipline and the market wisdom needed in order to be able to figure out how to operate the hospital. So a trillion dollars is going to be a massive headache because you could, if you want to spend it in a sort of very generous way, I think you're going to end up with a lot of um, expensive, malfunctioning, hospitals and schools and uh, infrastructure. So it's a tricky question. I guess I guess I can just distribute it. I maybe find the um, three billion poorest people in the world and give them each uh, 300 dollars worth, I guess. And yeah, but give them to them in Bitcoin form and suggest that they hold it for the long time. They don't just spend it immediately because if they all go and take it and spend it immediately, it would uh, bring the price of Bitcoin crashing down. So maybe devise some kind of scheme where you give people a small amount of Bitcoin and then if they don't, if they don't spend it, they get a bigger amount. They get another amount uh, after a periodic period, after a certain period. So that's going to teach people to save. And that would probably be good, I guess. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. I actually are the first one to say in the podcast about I would buy with all of it Bitcoin, distribute it to Bitcoin, with Bitcoin to all the people. So um, my next question is, can you tell us, describe yourself and like, what is your current obsession? How does your daily life look like to get to know you a bit more personal? Mm -hmm. My current obsession is Bitcoin. It's been that way for several years now. Um, I've um, quit my job at university to focus on Bitcoin. So I talk and uh, write about Bitcoin pretty much all day, every day. Um, On my other obsessions, I am also a carnivore. I've eaten nothing but meat for the last eight and a half years. 
I eat meat and I drink water. That's it. That's all I do. Wow. So uh, that is it. Yeah. Eight and a half years now. And uh, my family as well. I have uh, three kids and a wife and I love them a lot. And I spend a lot of time with them. I play football with my kid, um, build magnet tiles with the, the kids. So that's, um, that's generally how my life is. And are you happier? What's the reason you are carnivore for eight and a half years? Um, the basic answer is that I tried it and I felt so much better that I could not go back. It's, uh, it's amazing. Once you try to eliminate, uh, plants from your body and then you go for a few weeks of just eating only meat, the differences that you feel in your body is just absolutely amazing. Uh, the, you're just so much stronger, so much faster, so much sharper. The ability to focus and work for long periods of time is like nothing I've ever experienced. So I wrote all my books as a carnivore, and I'm pretty certain, pretty certain I would never have been able to write those books before because I just didn't have the focus and didn't have the ability to sit down and focus and uh, um, dedicate myself to a long-term project. It's very difficult when you're constantly high on sugar and constantly high on uh, eating plant food. I mean, I know a lot of people are able to focus even as they eat plants, but I'd encourage them to try a month with no plant food and see how much more productive you become. Well, I'm vegetarian for two and a half years. So um, um, <laughs> maybe in the future, I will try just for one month for an experiment to see the difference. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that would be great. Actually, as a vegetarian, do one month and to make a video about it to see the experience that you go through. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I have two last questions. Mm -hmm. So first question is, uh, did we didn't talk about uh, something that you wanted to talk in this podcast, something that you want to mention to the world, to the people? Can't think of anything, to be honest. I'm not sure um, what, what I'm going to tell people. Well, I know. Except that by big I hope to visit Cyprus one day. Oh, I'm very yes. close to Cyprus, but I've uh, never been. And many times we fly over Cyprus and I get to see it. So I've seen it so many times from above, but I've never been. I'd love to go. I hear you guys have beautiful beaches. I love the Mediterranean. I got to try it out. This summer would be cool. I, I'm... I'm, I'm the best host in Cyprus. I know the place. <laughs> I can show you the coolest spots and give you a good tour. Let's do that. Let's make that happen. Me? And also, uh, the last question is, so you're going to die after this podcast. Um, and this will be your last words uh, that you have to say to the people or to your family. And if you actually die in a hundred years from now, in 50 years, we're going to come back and see your last words in this podcast, what you want to say to the world, 40, 30 seconds, whatever you want. Respect people's property rights. Use Bitcoin, eat meat. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I love you. Thank you for watching, guys, until the end.